All right, welcome back. I'm gonna round out our uh, plant form and function uh, section of the course here, talking about the particular specific plant cells and tissues that make up the primary body, and then end this with a more detailed discussion of secondary growth as it uh, compares to primary growth. And that should wrap up this plant form and function section of the course. So when we talk about plant cells, you know, plant cells are different than animal cells, and they have a they have a couple of things that are are are, are very important that differentiate them from from animal cells, and those main things are um, cell walls, and these cell walls are important as we'll see um, because they are comprised of cellulose. So cell wall composed of cellulose. This actually allows the cell to maintain, that cell to maintain a specific shape, whether it is depleted in terms of its uh, cellular contents or, 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 or full in terms of cellular contents. That shape actually is maintained. Um, plant cells also have vacuoles. And this is different than in animal cells. And this large vacuole is responsible for the storage of macromolecules and ions. And this is, as we'll see um, when we talk about water movement in plants, it's actually incredibly important for being able to May regulate what enters and exits the cell. By having this vacuole, plants are able to move certain ions or macromolecules into the vacuole so that the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell um, are, can be regulated in terms of those ion concentrations. I'll talk about that in more detail in our next chapter. But having this plant, this vacuole is obviously, you know, it's something that's really important to be able to to manipulate the contents of the inside of the cell. Um, and of course, plant cells have chloroplasts. And so here we see some chloroplasts inside the plant cell. Um, and that's, of course, for photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis. Another really unique part to plant cells is that adjacent plant cells are all connected by plasma desmata. Plasma desmata are these actual gaps in the cell wall that connect one cell to another. This has led some people to actually um, some people to actually talk about the plant body as sort of one large unit. All of the cells sort of are interconnected by this plasma desmata, which allows for really efficient communication from cell to cell. So these are differences between a plant cell and an animal cell, having uh, cell walls, vacuoles, and chloroplasts, and then also having plasma desmata to have these efficient communication from one cell, adjacent cells to the next. So it acts as sort of one big, huge cell rather than um, individual, individual cells. Okay, so uh, let's um, move, let's, keeping with, th with this in mind, let's look at the different cell types that are involved in the different tissue systems that I've talked about, um, being the dermal tissue, the vascular tissue, and the ground tissue. And so we'll all start from the outside of the plant, the dermal tissue system. Um, the dermal tissue system is the outermost cell layer in a plant, and it's one cell layer thick. Um, and as we've talked about with the, the epidermal cells, these are providing protection and they are reducing water loss. That's the main functions of the, of the dermal tissue and it's covering the entire plant, that outermost single layer of cells that's covering the entire plant body. It's also responsible for secreting the cuticle. 
which is going to be again for protection, but also mainly for um, reducing water loss from the plant. Um, this also reduces gas exchange. And so, like we've talked about, we have to, when you seal off the plant, you've got to maintain some openings for gas exchange to happen. And so, another important um, cell type that we see uh, in the in, in, in plants uh, in the dermal tissue system are the stomata themselves. So stomata are a dermal cell um, and these are responsible as we've talked about for maintaining the ability to, to move carbon dioxide in and out of the plant. So responsible for gas exchange and this is done through two cells, the guard cells, which flank that pore um, in, the, in that when these guard cells are turgid, that pore opens up and gas exchange can occur. And when the guard cells are flaccid, those, uh, that pore closes down and gas exchange doesn't occur. Third type of cells that we see um, in uh, the third type of cells that we see in our dermal tissue system are trichomes. And trichomes is just a, a fancy word for hair. So these are the hairs that we see on the plant body. Um, and these can have various different uh, functions depending on uh, the particular hairs and the location of those hairs. Um, and so uh, some of the functions that we can talk about with respect to trichomes. Um, one of these is protection. And that protection um, can be from herbivory. So these could be, these could be sharp, stiff uh, hairs that actually stop uh, an herbivore from munching on the plant. These could also be, um, so this can be both physical, sharp and stiff, or these can be chemical in that these hairs might actually uh, provide and store some toxic compounds that are defense against, against herbivores. And what we see in this photo here are these gland-tipped uh, trichomes. And those gland-tipped trichomes might actually, uh, you know, might contain some secondary compounds in them that actually stop, uh, you know, that actually uh, poison or prevent herbivory through those chemical compounds. Um, they also can provide, uh, sorry, I'll erase that. They also can provide UV protection uh, by reflecting light. So oftentimes in, in places where there's lots of UV radiation, you'll, uh, you'll see hairy plants and those are reflecting light away. Those both reflect that light to protect against UV, as well as um, keep the leaf surface cool by reflecting that light. And temperature protection. Okay, so we've got protection against herbivory, we've got protection against UV and temperature. Um, another uh, main, function here uh, is also to maintain moisture. Or decrease water loss. And this is done by providing by by having a layer of hairs on there, we create sort of a boundary layer that keeps the relative humidity around the outside of the plant higher which makes it so that passive water loss, water that's actually coming out of the tri out of the stomata, sorry, of the plant is reduced because we've got this sort of moisture air around the, um, around the surface of the plant because of this, uh, this boundary layer that we've created. The last one of, uh, the last function that I wanna mention here is carnivory. Carnivory. And so here we actually see a fly that's trapped in these sticky trichomes uh, of this plant called a sundew. Um, this is a particular type of carnivorous plant that 
uh, has these sticky trichomes, the insect gets trapped there, and then the leaf will actually roll up, and the trichome also produces digestive enzymes that help digest that uh, prey and provide those nutrients to the plant. The carnivory is, a, is a, another, um, another function of the trichome itself. Okay, our next uh, tissue system that we'll talk about is the ground tissue system. Um, and the ground tissue system has, uh, remember, makes up the bulk of the plant body. And it's really two main functions of this ground tissue system are photosynthesis that we see in leaves above ground and uh, um, green parts of the plant. So photosynthesis is one of those major functions. And then we see in the roots, energy storage being the other major function of the ground tissue system. And so in the, in the leaves and green parts of the plants, we see many chloroplasts. So this is where, uh, where that photosynthesis is actually taking place. And then in the roots, I already pointed these out in that root cross section um, earlier, we see all these little purple granules, purple staining granules. These are all starch granules. And so for those that don't know, starch is a complex carbohydrate. And so all those glucose molecules are put together and stored as starch in the roots of the plant. So there's our storage tissue, our storage function of the ground tissue. Um, when we talk about ground tissue in, in, uh, in all three, uh, you know, in, in both the photosynthetic plant parts of the plant and in the energy storage parts of the plant, there are really three main cell types that make up the ground tissue. Um, and I'll talk about each of these. So parenchyma is one of them. The second is cholenchyma. And then the third is sclerenchyma. And so these are cell types that we find in the ground tissue system. So I'll talk about each of these cell types um, in turn. The parenchyma are really the workhorse cells of the, of the body, so of the plant body. So these are our workhorse cells. They do most of the heavy, lift, heavy lifting in here. And as such, these are uh, relatively unspecialized cells that are, are very versatile. Um, and so, meaning that they can do lots of different, lots of different functions within the, within the cell. Um, and so just to show you a few of these different uh, types of, of parenchyma cells in a leaf cross section, that's what we have down here. Here's a leaf cross section. We see that upper epidermal layer, and then the bulk of it is made up of these different types of parenchyma cells. Um, and so all of those, the palisade parenchyma and the spongy parenchyma are both involved in photosynthesis. So these are two types of different parenchyma cells that we see inside of the leaf where photosynthesis is actually occurring. Um, and then in the root, which we have on the um, which we have on the left side here, on the right side here, we see these storage cells. And so each of these are parenchyma cells that are involved in storage um, here, storing starch granules. So here's all of these parenchyma cells storing these starch granules throughout the throughout the body. So these are relatively unspecialized cells, which makes them versatile in that they are doing lots of different, uh, lots of different functions. Um, 
They're also thin-walled. And so when we're looking at these in cross-section, all these thin-walled cells that aren't staining, the walls of these cells aren't staining like those dark vascular tissue cells, but they're, they're relatively thin-walled. And then um, these are living, parenchyma are living cells. So relatively unspecialized, thin-walled living cells that do the most of the work in the plants are parenchyma cells. Parenchyma cells, I've used this word already, um, but parenchyma cells are also the cells in the plant that are totipotent. And so if you remember what totipotent means, this is the ability to regenerate an entire plant from that single cell. So entire plant, sorry, from a single cell. This is a really important trait when it comes to uh, vegetative reproduction. So this is where we can actually have just a, a part of the stem get stuck in the ground and create roots and grow a new plant. Um, this is also really important for wound healing. Um, and this is what allows for tissue culturing. And so if you remove a part of a stem, the parenchyma cells that are there are going to start to divide to form what I call the callus. And that callus um, is the beginning of a new plant. And where, that, where those parenchyma cells are dividing, then um, those cells become undifferentiated um, and those can then differentiate depending on their position and into different parts of the plant. Like in this uh, picture that I have here, we have a coleus stem that was cut and then put into water and the callus would be underneath all of these roots that started differentiating out of that callus. So that callus is all of that dividing cells um, which you can start that new plant from. Those are our totipotent parenchyma cells, making up the majority of that ground tissue in the plant. The second cell type that I have listed is colenchyma. These, like parenchyma, are also living cells. And their primary function is to support the plant. Primary function is plant support. So structural support. Um, importantly, these are expanding, expandable and elastic cells. And so this is support for the growing parts of the plant. So any part of the plant that's actively growing, so as those cells are elongating and expanding, the co colenchyma cells are typically associated with that, which provides some structural support, but the colenchyma cells themselves are elastic um, and, and can actually expand and move. And so ones that everybody is familiar with are the strings that we find in celery. So when you eat a celery stalk, celery stalks are actually the petiole of a leaf of the celery plant. Um, and that's a expanding, growing part of the plant that, that needs to have some flexibility to it. And so those colenchyma cells are actually all of these strings, um, are a bunch of colenchyma cells that are, uh, that are put together and provide that elastic, provide support, but it's expandable and elastic support. Um, so, the colenchyma cells in general are thicker cell walled. So thicker primary cell wall. And when I say thicker, I mean thicker than parenchyma. 
uh, that can stretch easily. They're in growth. And when we look at these in cross section, part of that, that uh, elastic uh, thickened secondary, thickened primary cell wall are these irregular, give them these irregular shape. Um, so all of these have these irregular, um, they're irregularly shaped, regularly shaped cells because of that. Uh, thickened primary cell wall that's relatively elastic. All right, our third cell type that we find in the plant body are sclerenchyma. Sclerenchyma cells are different than parenchyma and colenchyma in that these are dead at maturity. And so these are thick, rigid cells. with lignified cell walls. Uh, lignified secondary cell walls. And so just as an aside here, lignin is a compound that makes cell walls hard. So that's an important one. I've talked about lignin and lignin and secondary cell walls in the um, in cell walls associated with xylem already. Um, but these, this is the lignin is that compound that actually makes these cell walls hard. Okay, so like xylem, sclerenchyma cells are dead at maturity, um, and they are made. They have these thick, rigid uh, secondary cell walls that are. Um, that have lignin associated with them. And what that means is that these cells can't expand. When we talk about sclerenchyma associated with the, um, sclerenchyma associated with the ground tissue, we really talk about two different types of sclerenchyma um, that we see. Um, we see them in fibers like on the left here, um, these are our fiber elements. And so if you remember associated with that phloem, we saw those fiber caps on each vascular bundle, that's made up of a bunch of sclerenchyma cells. And so here we have a little bundle. Uh, this is actually a fiber cap. There's a little bundle of sclerenchyma cells that makes up, uh, that together forms some stiff, rigid supporting tissue these fibers that run throughout the plant. Um, the other type of sclerenchyma cell that we find commonly are sclerids. Sclerids are flattened out cells. Um, so these are flat, hard cells. And these are very common in like the seed coat or hard parts of the plant um, that we see in like the seed coat or fruit coat. So all of those shiny cells on the outside of a fruit or on the outside of a seed, those, those shiny hard cells are these sclerids, um, these uh, that are a, a type of sclerenchyma cell. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, our last tissue type that I'll talk about here is the vascular tissue. Um, we've talked uh, already about vascular tissue to some extent, and so some of this will be a little bit of a review, but uh, just as, uh, just because we just talked about sclerenchyma, well, tracheids that are in xylem are actually a type of sclerenchyma cell. Um, these are sclerenchyma that are specialized to transport water. 
and so these are, remember, just like when we talked about before, um, these are, this is a longitudinal section of a bunch of sclerenchyma. So these are these long tubes that are stacked up next to each other in these tracheids that are then responsible for moving water through them. Um, and each of them have pits associated with them. And remember, those pits are there to connect the tracheids together. So these connect tracheids to each other. And I'll just, as a reminder, um, remember that it, what we see are what we call bordered pits. And bordered pits have these secondary cell walls with a gap. Oops. Secondary cell walls with a gap. And the primary cell wall is intact. And that allows for water movement, because water can move through the primary cell wall freely. So that allows the water movement to move between tracheids. But the secondary cell wall water can't go through. And so we've got, we have to have a gap. And so we have a gap in the secondary cell wall, no gap in the primary cell wall, and water can move freely between these elongate, dead sclerenchyma cells that make up the xylem, or what we call the tracheids in the xylem. Well, there's a not, this is, makes up a, a large major, this is, makes up a large majority of the, of the xylem tissue that we see in vascular plants. Um, but in some vascular plants, there's a, another specialized uh, type of uh, vascular tissue that are called vessels. And so vessels are specialized sclerenchyma cells that we find only in angiosperm. Specialized sclerenchyma in angiosperms. And these, it, just like tracheids in the rest of vascular plants and angiosperms, the vessels are for water transport. Um, what we end up with, uh, so vessels are a little bit different in that instead of being elongate and relatively narrow like tracheids, these are short and wide. Um, and they have both perforations as well as pits. And so the pits, um, the pits are different in vessels in that pits have gaps in both the primary and secondary cell walls. And so even though the water can move through a primary cell wall, it's inhibited some, while the pits in the in vessel elements actually have gaps in that secondary cell wall and primary cell wall, and so water can freely move between them. Um, and then they also have perforations, which are larger openings. in both primary and secondary cell walls. On the ends of vessels. So the end of each vessel element has perforations in it, the, these larger uh, gaps in both the primary and secondary cell wall, and that allows water to move more efficiently. And so overall, these are more efficient water movement in vessels. And so really what we've done here is in when we compare tracheids and vessels that we see in angiosperms, oops, this should say tracheids, sorry about that. Uh, what we have done is actually a division of labor. And so in angiosperms, there's a division of labor in the xylem, where vessels move the majority of water, 
and tracheids then are there to provide support. So tracheids are for structural support. And so here's an electron micrograph showing um, a se section of wood. So here's the longitudinal section on this side and the cross section from the top. And what we see are these large vessel openings. And so these, uh, sorry, we see the uh, uh, longitudinal section here on the, on the side and we see this cross section across the top. And what we see are these large vessel openings, big, huge vessel openings here. Um, the rest of all of these are these small diameter things are all our tracheids. And so we see comparing the size and diameter of a vessel versus a tracheid, vessels are way more efficient for moving water than tracheids are. You can really move water efficiently through vessels. And so we divide the labor in angiosperms where most of the water movement in angiosperms is happening through these large straws, these big vessel elements that are running throughout and all of the little tracheids that are in between are, are just there for structural support, primarily there for structural support. Some water will still move through tracheids, um, but it's important to, that, to say, you know, in angiosperms, we have evolved a more efficient use, uh, a more efficient uh, water movement in the vessel elements themselves. Okay, cool. So let's uh, um, move on to uh, what we see in the phloem. And so vascular tissue also is composed of phloem. Phloem, you'll remember, are living cells. So just as a, as a reminder, phloem are living cells in the phloem. And so as a result, these are a little bit different um, and are made up of actually two different types of cells. One is the sieve tube element. And so sieve tubes are living, that are living cells that are long and thin and tube-like for moving those sugars, but they're mostly empty of organelles or all of the bits and pieces that are needed to keep a cell alive. And so because of that, they each, each sieve tube element has associated with it a companion cell. And those companion cells are the life support for the sieve elements, life support cells for the sieve tubes elements, the sieve tubes. So these are essential pieces of the puzzle here for loading and unloading sugars. Uh, from the phloem. To other parts of the plant. So if you remember water moves passively through the plant. Xylem cells are dead at maturity and that water is moving passively. We'll talk it to a large, uh, you know, in a lot of detail about how water is moved through the plant. Phloem, remember, is actively moving sugars in the plant. And what I meant by actively moving that is that it takes energy. This takes ATP to have to, to for, for phloem to actually move things. And that's what I mean by loading and unloading. So you actually have to put sugars into the sieve element and you've got to take them out of those sieve elements. And the companion cells are responsible for regulating that process. Um, so if we look at these in a longitudinal section, we see our sieve tube elements here um, connected by plates that allow them to be uh, connected on top of each other like a stack of straws to be able to move those sugars and then associated on each, associated with each grouping of sieve elements are these companion cells next to them. And so again, we can look at it in cross section. We see our sieve plate here on the top. Those are the sieve elements that are moving those 
uh, that where the sugars are actually moving through. And then next to these are our companion cells that are responsible for regulating um, the loading and unloading of sugars into these sieve tube elements themselves. Okay, so we can summarize all the plant tissues. This is a table, um, the plant cells and tissue types that, that make up the plant body. This is a table that's from your book. This is a really good summary of all of this section of the class. And so I would, I, I'm just highlighting it here. I'm not gonna go through it in any detail here, except to say like, hey, this is one to come back to that sort of gives you a nice description of each of these tissues um, and cell types and then the functions associated with those. Awesome. Okay, what I wanna do now is just round this out uh, by talking about secondary growth. So I know we've already talked about secondary growth, um, but I wanna detail what you're actually seeing when we look at a cross section and where this is come, where, where uh, each of these cell types are actually coming from um, in the, when we, look at a, when we look at a cross section. And so here's a cross section of a three-year-old stem from a basswood tree. Uh, the genus Tilia. Um, and I just want to point out a few different, uh, uh, just sort of label some of these parts. And so here we see a differentiation sort of between what we see on the inside, which is all our, whoops, not 20, which is all our secondary xylem, and the outside, which is all our, oh, I did it again which is all of our secondary phloem. And those are separated by that vascular cambium, which remember the va vascular cambium increases the width or the girth of the plant by producing cells both to the outside and to the inside. And so remember that's bifacial, uh, this bifacial cambium makes xylem toward the inside and phloem toward the outside. And so if we think about this is where this division is happening from, xylem to the inside, phloem to the outside, we can actually think about the different, when these, each of these uh, years of growth occur. And so the current year of growth, this year three, is actually closest to the outside of the stem because are closest to the vascular cambium. So these are the newest cells that were put on by the vascular cambium. The oldest cells that were put on by the vascular cambium are here in year one. Um, and so those are from two years ago. Year one would have been two years ago, and then a year ago, year two, and then this year's growth, year three. And so what's on the inside here? Well, this is some of the primary tissue that's on the inside. And so our primary, xylem all the way at the inside to the center of that stem. And so as this, th this is only three years old, once you get to be 10 years old, that primary xylem just gets crushed in the middle. So all of that uh, new tissue just crushes, all the secondary xylem crushes all of that primary tissue. And we end up not being able to see any of the primary tissue after a couple of years of, of growth occurs here. There's a second the cambium, a lateral meristem or a secondary meristem in here, and it's right out toward the surface. Um, you can't, it's not differentiated well in this picture, but this is called the cork cambium. And the cork cambium, just like the vascular cambium is producing, uh, is producing cells and creates lateral growth, but this is unifacial. It only does them to the out, it only produces cells to the outside and it's responsible for making bark. Um, so another word for bark is actually cork. Cork that we see in a, like a wine bottle or something comes from the bark of a particular tree, the cork oak, um, which grows in the Mediterranean region. But so the cork cambium is producing cork or what we also call bark. So those lateral meristems, both of these, um, both the vascular cambium and the cork cambium are lateral meristems. So vascular and cork cambium are lateral meristems. 
otherwise known as secondary meristems. Awesome. Well, let's look in detail at, uh, at each of these meristems. And so this is just zooming in on that, uh, on that secondary growth in this, in this branch. We see the cork or bark being produced by the cork cambium. And the cork cambium adds cells just to the outside. And so this is a unifacial cambium where the vascular cambium adds some cells to the outside and many cells to the inside. And so this is that bifacial cambium, making both secondary xylem and secondary phloem um, in, in dividing these into secondary xylem and secondary phloem. Okay, so that's looking at this microscopic, uh, uh, you know, looking at these mic microscope slide views of these, um, of these cell types. Let's look at what does it look like when we see a, um, you know, a piece of wood, right? Wood is that secondary xylem, and we can actually see um, this, see the, the differentiation here between the xylem and phloem. And so if we look at this sort of layer right here, this is the vascular cambium. So this is where the vascular cambium would be. The outside bark or cork was created by the cork cambium, which is not drawing a very good layer here, but here's our cork cambium right to the outside, just making the bark to the very outside. What's all of this tissue in between the vascular cambium and the cork cambium? This is all our secondary phloem. And then the large majority of this is all secondary xylem to the inside of the vascular cambium. All of this is secondary xylem that's, a, that's occurring here. And we see the secondary xylem is sort of broken into two kind of distinct regions. One that we're calling sapwood, that's toward, closest to the vascular cambium. And so this is our active secondary xylem. And what I mean by active is this is where most of the water is being transported. H2O transport still happening in the sapwood part. The heartwood part, which is this darker stained area in here, is all of this non-functional secondary xylem. And so now this is really just providing support for the rest of the tree in this case. Where would the primary xylem have been? Well, the primary xylem would be right there in the center. And you can see how through X number of years of growth here, that's all the secondary xylem has crushed that toward the middle. We do the same thing and we look to the outside. Where's our primary phloem? Well, the primary phloem gets crushed up against the cork cambium and gets kind of sloughed off. And so the cork cambium is regenerating new um, cork or new bark to the outside as the, uh, the secondary phloem is getting sort of sloughed off and, and, and uh, removed from the plant. So we've got non-functional wood, heartwood, We've got uh, the functional wood, the secondary xylem or sap wood that's still moving water. We've got our secondary phloem that's moving the photosynthate and then uh, the bark or the cork that's produced from the cork cambium. And you notice in this drawing and within each of the, which in each, the in the secondary xylem, you can see these distinct bands or what we call growth rings in the plant. Um, and so it's, ni it's nice to talk about what growth rings actually are, um, are resulting from. And so growth rings are the result of seasonal variation that we see in cell size. And so if our vascular cambium is, let's say our vascular cambium is over on this side of the plant, um, and this is the center of the stem um, toward the left, and the outside of the stem toward the right, what we, um, 
what we can see here is that early in the, that that early in the so sorry each one of these makes up one year of growth And so if our vascular cambium is all the way to the right side of this, the earliest, uh, the first cells produced in that year, can't see that very well. The first cells produced in any year are going to be these larger cells, down, the, the larger diameter cells that are to the left here where later in the growing season, we see these smaller diameter cells that are being produced here. And what that ends up creating is this variation from large cells to small cells. So large cells during the spring, and then small cells during the fall, create this seasonal variation in cell size and it creates these nice even or nice growth rings that we see when we look at a piece of wood. And so just to summarize that, I realized that I said that in a confusing way. The larger cells are thinner walled and are produced early in the year. So in the springtime, we produce larger thin walled cells when lots of water is available and we're moving a lot of water through the plant. And that then diminishes through the summer and into the fall when we start making smaller, thicker walled cells. Later in the growing season. And then in areas where seasonality, where we see freezing, then we have that sort of dormancy period. And then back in the next spring, we'll end up making bigger cells again and uh, followed by smaller and smaller and thicker and thicker cell walled to in the fall. And then we see another formation of a growth ring. And so one growth ring equals one year of growth. And we see that variation in cell size based on these big water, big thin walled cells that are early in the growing season when water is available. And then as that water becomes less and less available later in the growing season, we see these smaller thick walled cells that are formed. We get these patterns in the growth rings um, from year to year. And so when we look at a piece of wood, we can actually, we can, we can see that um, in that early in the, um, so this one is, is looking at some climatic fluctuation. This is a study, a, a field of study called dendrochronology. Dendrochronology, you actually can look at the patterns that we see in growth rings and actually interpret something about the environment that these uh, occurred in. And so this one is one where we're looking at these thick walled cells, or sorry, these thick growth rings um, showing up before the onset of acid rain and then when grow, acid rain comes on, we see that growth is, is diminished in this plant. And so we see a bunch of thin growth rings year to year when growth is less. Um, and so early on, bigger growth, you know, bigger, uh, each year was more showing more growth than later on where we see less and less growth in these compacted growth rings. All right, so the other thing that I like to point out on this slide is here you can see this differentiation between late wood, so these dark bands, this is what I would call late wood, or growing, uh, this is, uh, these are cells that were put on late in the growing season, as contrasted with the uh, early wood, or cells that were put on early in the growing season. So where we, the dark part of these growth rings are these small thick walled cells that are put on late in the growing season. And the light part of each growth ring are these larger thin walled cells that are put on early in the 
season. So sometimes you'll hear them referred to as early wood and late wood. Okay, um, that I think wraps up this uh, plant form and function section. Um, I will go ahead and stop here and we will start our next, uh, we'll start our next um, section in the next video talking about water and nutrient, water and sugar transport in plants. Thanks.